Well, thank you very much. So what does the Godfather have to do with Coca-Cola? Very good question. So in our presentation, we're talking a bit more about uh, what we call the data and protocol uh, conciliary. So what's a conciliary? You can read that yourself, but basically it's coming from Italy and Switzerland, and it's the trusted confidant of the boss. The person that the boss can go to and say, well, ask the tough question, tell me the real truth, tell me what's going on in my organization. I'm going to introduce you to our um, InfoTools uh, protocol conciliary, Cecilia Lacreca. She's based in Argentina, and unfortunately, she can't be here today. She's got errands to run, clearly, as the confidant. She's the sweetest thing about this height, absolutely sweet, but don't be fooled. She would be the first person to tell you that all good things come in small proportions, even poison. That's her words, not mine. And have you considered her surname, La Greca? She's Sicilian. So actually, you know, she's, she's the right person for this job. But what is a data protocol conciliary in our view anyway? So what are they doing? For Coca-Cola in their brand tracker, we're looking at about 19 plus markets. So we need a person who looks after them and making sure that all of these markets are protocol compliant in their um, data collection and then in a way that we can analyze the data and um, harmonize and bring it all back together. So that's the main component of their work. What else do they do? They help the agencies to um, script their, um, their surveys, design them, implement them. Um, we help them with market research questions. We help them to understand the data at times. We also help them uh, to um, when they change agencies because we are the owners, well, Coca-Cola, obviously, is the owners of the data. We help them when they, say, uh, change from one fieldwork agency to the next. So as uh, on total, you could say that we are basically like a market research uh, best practice hub. And one thing that I would like to go in a little bit more detail, that's not our slides, no, um, is um, what we have up there as well is an independent auditor. And I'll give you some examples of what's happening there out in the field. I might just change hands. So one of the examples we have here is um, where the agency changed their field um, provider, or the market changed their field provider. And despite the fact that they had a... Um, a super strong protocol, a handover notes, a, a very detailed um, interview script. Uh, they, you looked at the same sample, same composition. Most of you would agree with me that, yes, we can probably expect a, a, some sort of a market break, uh, trend break. And they did, uh, but it was massive. The trend break was beyond what we would have expected. So the, the market came to us and said, can you help us? What's going on? We don't understand. That was, of course, uh, slightly made a bit harder by the fact that the old agency didn't want to help us. So what we did, we sat with the interviewers, we went through the whole uh, scripts with them, sat next to them, and we finally found out that what they did differently to the previous suppliers, that they didn't prompt enough on specific questions, like what brands are you aware, what brands are you consuming, and so on and so forth, which, as you can expect, had a massive uh, input on their results. Yeah, we're on the second sample. Uh, that's good. So the second, second example is uh, in Europe, and the market came to us and said, we completely lost faith in the research. We lost faith in our agency. Um, we've seen trends going down for the last six months for all of the brands, um, and we can't explain it. And the agency tells us, no, no, everything is fine. We haven't changed a thing. So we went in again, we said to them, we spoke to them and said, what's going on? How often have you changed interviewers? Have you changed it more often than previously? And they said, no, that's all good. Um, what we found out after a while is that once the interviewers got trained on the job, after about three to four months, they got really comfortable with their job. They got too comfortable and they started um, speeding the respondents through the survey. But again, they started uh, prompting less and less. Uh, and as a result, a number of those uh, big KPIs just dropped and no one you know, picked it up. The third example should have never been an example for this case study because it's just ridiculous. And again, most of you will agree with it. Um, the agency, in their wisdom to help uh, with the sample effectiveness, which is another measure that we do, changed the composition of their sample. Well, guess what? The results changed, obviously. Uh, you see that the main change came for Coca-Cola. They changed the sample. They added more sample for the 30 to 39-year-olds and fewer respondents for the um, 20 to 29-year-olds, which is, of course, the main target sample for Coca-Cola. So again, we went into why this hasn't been discussed with the market in the first place before they made the changes. Don't ask me, please. 
My favorite example, and again, you will, some of you might shake your hands, some of you might love it. Um, again, we had the, the market coming to us and say, the results don't make sense. For all of the brands that we see in the market for the last five to six months, they're all going down in terms of their awareness, their consumption, everything. But we know that our market is really, really strong. All of the brands, we can see it in the sales data, is stable or go up. So we went in and we spoke to the agency. What have you changed? We haven't changed anything. We have the same interviewers. There is not a big interview or rotation or anything like that. Nothing has changed. So again, we went in, sat with them, couldn't find anything. And at some stage, someone said, well, hang on. About that time, we upgraded our data collection platform. It's like, OK, let's talk a little bit more about that. So it turned out that the new platform, which was better uh, in, in most senses, um, took a little bit longer for each screen to load for the catty interviewers. And you probably can expect what's the next thing. The interviewers, they're not stupid. They're realizing, hang on, my survey takes a little bit longer than normal. So I'm starting to take shortcuts. So again, we figured that out after a while. And we had to do a bit of big reshuffle, big reprocessing and everything. Um, but the main one for me in all of these things, and you might say, well, Horst, you know, that shouldn't happen. You know, that never happens with us. Well, I, I agree, it shouldn't, but it has. And there's more cases that we've seen. Um, and I think the other thing that's uh, for us, which is really the challenging part, is that all of those examples have one thing in common. They all have been found out about five to six months too late. When we've spent a lot of money onto the data collection and to the data processing, and in particular into reporting those results into senior management. So the, the, the potential um, really is, is huge to cause a lot of upset. So one of the things that we discussed uh, with uh, Coca-Cola and with the agencies now that their big checkers uh, completely digitized, we have online surveys, we have CATI, and we still have face-to-face -face in some markets, but they're now um, completed on tablet is to add a lot of extra metrics into our data processing. So things like interview ID, if we have it, how long have they been on the job, um, and more so uh, length of interview, parts of the in, uh, survey, how long is it for each individual part. And if we then compare it with the other information that we already have, the number of uh, brands reported, and so on and so forth, we have a, a guidance system that gives us some, uh, some warning and some uh, uh, I guess traffic lights in case something happens. So we're going to compare it on a month by month basis with the agencies and saying, well, does it, is this something that we would expect? And if it's out of the ordinary, we would go back to them and say, have a look. So hopefully instead of waiting six to seven months, we pick it after, up after two or three months. And why is this so important? Thomas, you want to tell us why this uh, data quality is so important to you guys? Sure. If one of these microphones works, oh, I think I'll give you this one. Me. Button, right? Good morning. So it's a, good, morning. good morning. Thank you. It's 1140. So some of you actually might be here for the 1140 session. So I apologize for that. Um, you're going to have to listen to, to me for the next five or seven minutes. Um, I only know three jokes and I have to tell one because it eases you. It eases me. So therefore it eases the relationship that we have for our time together. I'm gonna tell one. So there's a married man who actually suspects that his wife is going deaf. And he goes to the doctor because this is not a topic that you can bring up with your spouse. I mean, for those of you who are married, you know that. You would not just tell your spouse, hey, I think you're going deaf. And they'd be like, what? So that would be a problem. So he goes to the doctor and the doctor says, do the 30, 20, 10 test. Stand at 30 feet, ask her a question. If she hears you, great. 20 feet, if she doesn't hear you, code 20 feet. If she doesn't hear you, go to 10 feet and come back and tell me the result. So he gets home from work and he says, hey, honey, she's in the kitchen. What are, we, uh, what are we having for dinner tonight? And he's at 30 feet and he doesn't hear anything. So he's like, hmm, okay. So he goes about 10 feet, 20 feet, and he says, honey, what are we having for dinner? Still nothing. And he walks a little bit closer and he, now he's at 10 feet, just like the doctor said. Honey, what are we having for dinner? Radio silence. So he goes right behind her and says, Honey, what are we having for dinner? And she turns around and she says, Ralph, for the fourth time, we're having chicken. <laughs> so sometimes, 
Yes, he's the one going deaf, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, the point of telling that, is, and I'm gonna stretch to try to connect that to my message, um, is, is that the data is speaking to us if we're willing to listen. And I don't need to tell, I don't think I need to tell anyone that data quality matters. Um, everything that we do, when we talk about data to information to insight to action, that whole value chain or that whole funnel is predicated on the fact that we have quality data at the start. And, and that's something that I've experienced over the course of my career, and it's something that I've seen at Coca-Cola where um, you see a change in the results and you say, well, what, why, what's going on? And you go back to your agency partner, and this is not a knock on agency partners, it's the reality of some things that have happened and things we've experienced. And you say, well, can you just check that nothing has gone wrong? Nothing has changed in, in what we're doing in the field. And they come back and say, well, nope, everything's good. And you say, no, nope, check again, check again, check again. And the more you interrogate, the more you begin to find that the changes in the data actually have been introduced by changes in the way we're actually executing the study. And I've seen it, I've experienced it, and the, this is why this is so important for us is because, okay, well, if that's the what, data quality is the what and it's important, how are we gonna ensure it? And that's what we've decided to do within Coca-Cola. So just a little bit of context. We operate our brand guidance system in over 90 countries, and on any given week, we're doing anywhere from 40 to 50,000 interviews around the world. That's a lot of conversations happening. And they're happening in very diverse markets. And one of the things that we're accountable for is giving the Coca-Cola company a globally harmonized and consistent set of brand metrics. So that if you're looking at the brand equity within one market, you can compare it to another market as well. And that's what InfoTools and that's what the consigliere is doing because I'm not the godfather, I view the data as the godfather. And if you don't take care of the consigliere isn't taking care of the boss, the boss is gonna run me wild and run me ragged because I won't have a consistent or steady base to stand upon. So, so that's the why this is so important, is because whenever we tell our, our stakeholders that something's changed, we really wanna know that it's real. So there's three things that I just wanna quickly cover that our, I believe our stakeholders expect from us, and, and three things that I believe we've been able to realize as a result of the system that we've put in place. And the first one is, is trust. You know, it, it's nice to be able to not have conversations around the technical aspects of what we do. And you're talking about the meaning and the implications from the work and the, and the findings that we've got back from the research. And I can honestly say that when we're working with the CMO or any of the brand directors around the world, commercial officers within the company, we're not having conversations about the study and was it executed properly? Is the data right? We've moved beyond that. And, and that's really a good place to be. And, and that's because 24 by seven, we've got a system in place where we're just monitoring and making sure that the data is coming in. So I believe in quality at source. So that's the first aspect of, of the trust. The second piece is we have a very decentralized insights ecosystem. So because the decision making at Coca-Cola is done locally, so business units actually fund the brand tracker, they also fund the ongoing analyses that they do around the world, there's many, many agencies that are feeding off of this data set. So the other thing that InfoTools not only makes sure that the quality is coming in, but when the data is in the database, we know it's right because it's gone through a rigorous QC process. So that means that anyone pulling from that data, we're always pulling from the same set. So we're always look, working from one, I, I call it one version of the truth, if you will. The second thing is integration. How many of you have ever taken one insight from a study, one standalone study, and the whole earth moved and the leaders made a decision? One, oh wow, it's never happened for me. They're always looking at the, the information in context of a broader information set. And so having this also has allowed us to integrate the data that we get from our brand guidance system into other sources of information as well. So when we do see something that actually changed, we can spend our time understanding and putting it in the context if it's sales, if it's social media um, metrics, if it's sentiment or things that have changed maybe in the social space. So we're looking to put our brand guidance system within the context of a broader set of information that helps us tell a more complete story. And the last one is speed. Um, we have some very, the buzzwords at Coca-Cola now are lean and agile. And um, let me tell you, agile is really getting, um, I guess, tested right now. We've got 
some of our leaders now that are saying, hey, I have a question on a Friday at five, well, you know, the weekend present, and it's, but I need it Monday at nine. Um, and if we didn't have this system in place, um, we'll talk about more of the, like, what that does for employee engagement and morale later. That's not a part of this talk track. Um, but the fact that we actually have a platform that we can draw upon, which allows us to pivot um, on a moment's notice is actually another benefit. And again, it's another expectation that our stakeholders have. So I just wanna just quickly wind down and say, I recognize that um, you know, a lot of clients rely on one agency to do end to end. And there's nothing wrong with that. My, I guess, guidance or advice is to say, just make sure you have a consigliere in place. For us, because we have such a disaggregated supply chain within how we collect our information, business units select their field work partners, business units select the analysis, we are responsible for the protocol and making sure that we have the best in class thinking, if you will, in terms of how to manage the brand or understand the brand consumer relationship. So that's our remit. And then we have a governance role. So whenever we look and compare across markets that we can actually say that the metrics are, are consistent and they can be compared. So in our model, we've decided to invest in a consigliere where their objective and we worked with them very closely along with our agency partners and along with our K&I or knowledge and insights professionals around the world to make sure that we are constantly monitoring. And I tell you, it's popped up things. We get red flags and we go to the market, we go to the agency and we check and we say, make sure this is right because we're catching it before it's too late. And the last thing I'll say about catching it before it's too late is the last version of our brand equity program was dying and we couldn't see it early enough because we weren't doing something like this. So because of what we're watching now, we can also be proactive in terms of seeing, wow, you know, the consumer response rates are changing, the sample sources are changing, the way that they're engaging with the actual survey is changing. We need to actually change the, the in fact, the experience for respondents. All of these things actually go into our ability to now be, I think, more proactive in terms of how we continue to evolve and innovate our brand tracking program so it's continually future-proofed. So I think I'm gonna try to get a, a little bit back on track. Yes, because I'm a minute and 52 seconds over. So thank you very much for listening. Thanks for coming. I hope this was useful for you. Thank you very much. Thanks for